Hey, you guys, it's your host, Julian. We're continuing our chats with the folks that helped bring Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Mutant Mayhem to the big screen. This week, we've got the board artist for my favorite scene in the movie, that nod to old boy with a heavy bass line of no diggity, John Jackson. We're talking all things Mutant Mayhem, so if you haven't seen it yet, go watch it and then come back and listen. If you want to be a patron and help support this show as we grow, check the show notes and sign up today. Now, Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to my head podcast. I'm your host, Julian. Today, I'm joined by John. John, man, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Absolutely. Dude, I've I've talked about this movie. Uh, like, I fanboyed out. when you, Ladies and gentlemen, when you see the episode with Andrew, you'll see, like, we fanned out really hard about this movie, and we should. We're talking Mutant Mayhem, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, and John here had this scene that was... This scene, I told you just a minute ago, like, worth the price of admission. Uh, it was my favorite scene in the entire movie, I literally stood up and said, let's go at the top of my lungs. A 34 year old <laughs> male. I was so pumped when No Diggity drops from the Fugees and when they are doing that old boys, that old boy playoff, that scene, that hallway fight scene. Um, I loved every second of that, man. I would love to know, like, how does that scene come across your, across your desk? Or how do you, did you have to ask for that scene or how'd they find you for that one in particular? Yeah, good question. Like, uh, no, uh, it had been worked on before. That's the thing is like in animation, you it's a big fat group project, right? Mm -hmm. So you're just uh, getting like, you might be like the third pass of the scene. You know, my friend Charlie Parisi, who uh, is an amazing story artist, he got the script and it said, you know, they fight mobsters to classical music. So he kind of made it a, just have a different tone. And it was very much a montage and he had these really great ideas. And then later they edited his boards to no diggity. And that was like, it just like hit in the edit. And then, you know, they made all these changes to the script. Uh, they did all these mobsters that had quote unquote appearance based nicknames, you know, that they kind of riff on in the thing. So I don't know, me and Charlie just talked and uh, yeah, I, I, I didn't ask for it. I was so like fortunate to get that scene. I, it was already a fun scene and I just got to do like a pass on it. And uh, I was like, we got to keep no diggity. Mm -hmm. in this and if i can with the boards let's like board it to this like to the beat like uh like mickey mousing you yes. know something they call it like let's really rhythmically uh make this song you know fit uh which maybe hadn't been thought of before so like um yeah it was it was so fun <laughs> but, i can imagine now you said uh, when it was originally in its first pass, they were talking about uh, classical music or a classical song. Yeah. Uh, when when something like that's happening, are, do they give you guys like, hey, it might be one of these couple songs as far as classical goes? Or are you guys just going out and trying to find anything on YouTube or Spotify that's classical and then that's what you're trying to get influenced by? Or how does that work? Oh, man, it, it really depends. You know, sometimes it depends on your director, right? Uh, sometimes they have a really particular idea idea um like i think there are some naughty by nature songs and like some fun like uh kind of like old school hip-hop songs that were always just in and they were always going to be in the movie and I, I think that's jeff rose and seth rogan's kind of like um wheelhouse style showing but there was room, right, for other musical exploration. And yes, yeah, some I think for Charlie, sometimes you just get a script and and it's it's sort of it's it's sort of an outline. They have some ideas, and then you maybe pitch um and do the research and go, hey, I I visualize it to this song, you know, and and so as a story artist, sometimes you get to do that research and then other times they give it to you and so I don't know. Um, I always like when you get kind of an open-ended assignment, which 
this movie, I'll say, Jeff Rowe is so open to your suggestions. Like, I don't, I feel like you see it in the movie too. Like he, he's just open to the best idea. And so anything you throw at him, or if you have a different idea, he's very open to it. Um, and which made him, I don't know, just like really fun to work with. I can imagine Andrew brought up those uh, same sentiments. He was very open to anybody and everybody in the room. He would listen to it. And there was, uh, there was another guy that, uh, I've heard that so much about, and I'm, I'm pretty sure you know him. Everybody knows him in the animation world. Brad Bird, you know, I talked to, oh, yeah, uh, yeah I, I talked to a guy uh, named Randy Myers, one of my favorite guests of all time, and uh, cool. he worked on the Iron Giant, my favorite animated movie of all time, and he said they would have these whiteboards of just ideas, and he would listen to anything and everything, and then he would take the time if it didn't fit into the story or if it wasn't going to go for the story, he would tell you why it didn't work within the constraints of the story, and I always wow. find that's very cool, especially like wherever you work at if you got somebody that's just not just telling you no or just because i said so type of thing they're explaining something or if they're open to suggestion i feel like it's a better work environment obviously he or she is going to have to take that uh take that brunt whether it's a yes or a no and take it all the way um but when people are open to suggestions it's crazy to see how far something can go with the collaborative effort that you guys have uh that you guys have done in that in that movie um with uh with this uh or sorry, just to, it, oh, no, I, I just feel like that takes um, humility. I, I, mm-hmm. I think uh, it, I think it takes humility to be that Brad Bird, that Jeff Rowe to yes. say, hey, I don't, I'm not a free, like, I'm not the guru here because mm-hmm. I am called the director. They're more like the collectors of ideas and then they sift through, but some aren't as open and so I, I think it's really cool when creatives are kind of like uh humble and open you know like oh absolutely yeah yeah i mean it like i said it makes a great work environment when you can go to somebody and they know and you know they're not going to shoot your idea down just because yeah. you know you're x y and z when it comes to wherever you're at on the totem pole you know it makes you feel empowered to actually go and do the best job you can you know when you got somebody that's got your back you're going to going to try a lot harder for him than somebody that's going to shoot down every idea you got um you know with this scene how many times do you think with this scene in particular how many times do you think you listen to no diggity how how many times do you have it on the loop (laughs) that's funny um yeah i a lot honestly a lot uh i was going through you know because we were chatting it on instagram before this and like i was going through the previous boards and i uh, i was remembering like oh yeah i the beginning especially i listened to that little like lead in uh mm-hmm. to where dr dre like you know starts dropping his verse like that little section um oh man it's like it's like imprinted on my brain yeah <laughs> yeah are you dreaming in no diggity is that what you're saying yeah yeah i was dreaming my wife was just like hey listen you gotta pick another song no but uh mm-hmm. It's true. It, and I was so, you know what's cool about that song though? Like, I I really do think like, okay, cool. I, I got, I was, I was lucky to, and fortunate to work on this scene, but man, that the song makes it like. Mm-hmm. Well, it, it, it definitely enhances what you guys did. You guys, you guys carried the, the, the workload. You guys carried the weight essentially throw out a cowboy bebop reference. Um, yeah. You know, but it, it's like that scene in particular, like when I think of that, that encapsulated the entire movie for me. You know, I, there's two scenes in particular that I, I think when I look back at this movie and I'd have to go back and rewatch this movie um, and I can't wait for it to hit digital so I can. Uh, having three kids, it's very hard to get out and watch movies, you know, um, really? and yeah, it's it's been difficult. But, uh, you know, it's fun nonetheless having kids. Um, but that scene and then that first scene when you see them out there and then all of new york is enjoying the movie out in the in the in the park like those scene those two scenes in particular just like encapsulate the ninja turtles for me like when i think of that movie those are the two scenes um when you're working this scene obviously you got four turtles to pull from now i would love to know i'm pretty sure you've been asked this hundreds of times but uh what was your favorite turtle and has that changed since you were a kid and what was your favorite turtle to work on for this scene in particular Mm, that's fun uh I, hey, listen, first of all, I got to admit, like, uh, people having worked on this movie, it's really fun because people come to you with their 
diehard turtle fandom stories mm -hmm. and uh there's so much love for this franchise and i frankly did not grow up a turtle kid like yeah. uh I yeah I wasn't raised on the '90s movies. I was just raised on other stuff. I was like a Courage the Cowardly Dog, Dexter's Lab, like uh, Nightmare Before Christmas. Kid. You should listen to my podcast. You yeah, should, I've, I've had I've had almost every big guy that you can manage. How old are you by by the way? You said probably about my uh, age, thirty-two. 34. Oh, so we're we're right there, man. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm, this is the shameless plug for my podcast. Even if you're on it, man, just go take no, a deep no, dive. No, no, give it. I, I've had I've had almost every creator from those '90s, with the exception of Gendy Tartakovsky and uh, Danny Antonucci. I'm working on John R. Dilworth, which is the creator of Courage the Cowardly Dog. Um, awesome. If you like Grim Adventures of Billy and Mandy, I've had Maxwell Adams. Maxwell Adams is coming on uh, in a couple weeks again, where he's going to do our Halloween episode this year. Um, so yeah, man, it's I'm a huge Cartoon Network fan, and uh, it's sad that the studio had to merge with Warner Brothers. Um, I feel like a piece of my child. I'm from Orlando, Florida. I already told you, uh, but Nickelodeon yeah. Studios was here. So when I drive past that Nickelodeon hotel that we would always see on all that and stuff, the orange, green, and purple, or orange, green, and all that other shit, uh, it's now like <laughs> doo doo brown and gray. It's it's they oh. devoid it of all color and all innocence oh. of being a kid, you know. So I didn't mean to derail your your cartoon uh, your your cartoon thing there, but that was a shameless plug for you to come and check out the podcast. I'm with you. I'm listening to that. I I love Courage the Cowardly Dog. I I all my nephews are are very like scaredy cat type kids. Mm -hmm. Um every movie my sister was like they saw Sing 2 and they couldn't finish it, you know, they're freaked out and I was totally the creepy kid. It was like give me more creepy Courage the Cowardly Dog. Yeah. Um like borderline horrific imagery with a Nightmare little bit of fuel. Coffee. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it agreed with me. So um, that's really, I'll, 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 I'll definitely check that out. That's awesome. Yeah, I'll send you the episode for uh, the head writer, man. That guy was so fucking cool. David Stephen Cohen, cool. man, one of my favorite guests as well. Um, but yeah, um, going back, I didn't mean, like I said, I didn't mean to derail you, but you were talking about you didn't grow up with the Turtles, man. But uh, working on this right. movie, it felt like yeah. every single person that was on this movie was a fan. I mean, the love exudes from the screen, from the writing to the to the boarding to the animating to the music that's played in this like everything there wasn't one dull moment in this there wasn't one you know fucking turtle shell unturned you know when you think about it pun intended um but uh it, it felt like you guys were all fans man so with you being kind of on the outside looking in was it what were you going back and reading or watching to kind of get into the mindset of these turtles well i will say what got me in was definitely before getting asked to be on this movie the rise of the teenage mutant ninja turtles show that's a fun uh, one that animation is just nuts like yes it is bonkers and uh i didn't know and then now you see primal and a lot of great 2d animated shows just, great just have like really great quality animation but man rise of the teenage mutant ninja turtles there the quality of animation was so out of this world. So that that kind of got my attention. I thought they, they were going to ask me to work on that movie when I first got the call. And then, mm -hmm. you know, but we had such a, we have this guy, Andrew Joustra. Uh, I hope I'm not butchering your name, Andrew, if you're listening to this. But um, he was like the dramaturg or like the, historian of ninja turtles for this project mm -hmm. so like any piece of turtle mania trivia anything he like had it locked so we always could like ask him stuff and uh but from there it was just me watching stuff and um getting a feel for okay how how do we know the the brothers were conveyed before and uh, where are we taking them? Because they definitely wanted to take them in a new direction. Uh, but yeah, I, I. And to answer your earlier question, like Michelangelo, I think is always yeah. the guy for me because I just love his eating um, crazy <laughs> things on different pizza. I love the reference in this movie where he's like, I eat, I put waffles on my pizza or whatever. Um, but yeah, no, I I had to kind of learn 
on this project and uh, just watch stuff. And I've become so much more of a fan, like uh, just being a part of this. And so I'm, I'm like grateful to be like late. I'm late to the party, but like, like happy to be here. If that makes oh, sense. Oh, absolutely. There's, there's so many times that I'm glad you brought up primal um, because yeah. there's, there's so many things that I'm glad that I'm seeing now. Um, I don't, I don't know when the last time you watched, and I've talked about this on my podcast before, but go back and watch, if you haven't watched Samurai Jack in a while, go back and watch the entire series of Samurai Jack. Watch it as an adult. Like I've, I've told myself so many times where like, I used to think that I could appreciate Samurai Jack when I was 12, when it was coming out. If I could go back in time, I'd kick my own ass and say, you don't know shit. The, the yeah. movie or the show, excuse me, uh, Samurai Jack, I, I don't think I could have appreciated anywhere near being 12. It took me uh, 20 something years later, having three kids, having a little bit of perspective, understanding loss, understanding, you know, gaining and all this other shit that I, I, I went through that Jack also went through to, to appreciate this shit. So I think things come in and out of your life at, at the time are supposed to, I'm not going to get any like guru type of shit on anybody, but it's like things are supposed to happen when they're supposed to happen. And like turtles, turtles are all ages, man. I, I've seen people, you know, in their fifties now that I've seen them with her go I go to comic cons all the time and then yeah. I see old guys or old girls that are just decked out they've got tattoos of turtles so they're all turtled up their kids sometimes their grandkids are turtled up so it's like this thing it just it's there's something in there for everybody whether you like the turtles or you like the villains or you like you know pick a character man there's somebody there's something out there for somebody there's how do I say that there's something in there for everybody is what I meant to say um but yeah uh absolutely man um so going back to to you said michelangelo was your favorite was he your favorite one to board for this entire sequence or did you like one of the other turtle sequences a little bit better oh man i i always well man if we're talking about this particular no diggity scene like what a nightmare like i was just on youtube like okay <laughs> yeah he, he has nunchucks mm -hmm. um but how do, you, how do you uh learn like nunchuck choreography and and uh how does that work and um without making it overly violent because this is going to be a pg-13 pg movie and we're not lopping off heads you know in this scene mm -hmm. uh raf for me seemed the easiest it, it's really? kind of like it's, yeah i don't know like the size just made sense to me, just slashing, uh -huh. kind of like Wolverine. He's sort of just like yeah. slashing and throwing and catching and doing cool, you know, moves with his wrists. Mm -hmm. And I always like enjoyed that. And um, I have him like ripping a pillow apart or something. <laughs> but uh, Michelangelo's was hard because how do you, uh, you know, I was just watching a lot of Bruce Lee. I think Enter oh, the Dragon, good. he does some, uh, yes. um, yeah, and so a lot of that, um, and then Donnie, you know, how, how do you make Donnie's moves different from Michelangelo's, and how do you, you know, <laughs> those weapons are all so different, so I, I, it was such a nightmare to, like, learn how all of those are used, because I never really worked on a, uh, like a kung fu ninjutsu mm -hmm. type thing before so yeah i don't know if the answer is your question but that was yeah uh pretty uh i'm like remembering how stressed uh, stressed i was <laughs> and, uh <laughs> you know oh absolutely man uh yeah, uh, so my, my my oldest does karate and shit. So whenever oh, he does cool. tournaments, he'll go and he started out with the bow staff for weapons and stuff. So they'll do like creative forms and, and you see him at you Google, you know, just forms for inner weapon. Um, and he would always place last because there was this uh, there was this female. And when they're in age brackets, they do male and female for um, for weapons and forms. And then for for fighting and sparring, they always separate men and women or uh, boys and girls. And, oh, okay. um, you know, so he would just get toasted when he would show oh. up with his bow staff, like, cause it's, it's, it's very, it's a bow staff, nothing against Donnie. Yeah. Like Donnie's always been my second favorite turtle. Raph has always been my guy. I've been such a huge fan yeah. of, of Raphael. Y'all, yeah. I mean, he's so great. He's, he's that character. That's like a Shrek, man. You peel back so many layers. It's like everybody just on the outside looking, he's, he's angry. 
yes yeah. and no, man. But you see how he cares for his brothers. You see that, you know, he gets mad at himself because he loses his shit. He knows he's got that anger issue that he's trying to work on, but he doesn't feel like he's being understood. So he's, like I said, there's so many layers to that 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 particular. It's just not just angry. Um, but, uh, yeah. you know, going back to uh, Hayden, he was doing bow staff and there was this uh, there was this chick in his, in, in his division. And then she, I think she was Aikido, maybe. I, I can't remember the discipline she did, but she had yeah. katanas or one katana, excuse me. And <laughs> dude, I'm telling you right now, like if she was a fucking samurai back in the day, I believe it, dude. She was <laughs> vicious. She was doing the craziest combinations of spins, flips, and all this other shit. I'm just like, he looks at me, and I'm looking at him, and I go, "You're not winning. <laughs> You're not getting anywhere." Like, just, give, close. just, just give in. <laughs> just yeah. appreciate yeah, just, this moment. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, just bow out, bro. You're you're not and like I think uh like the highest he'd ever finished when she was in his division because they were all the same age. I think he might have gotten yeah. second. So he beat out, you know, um I don't know what they're called, but it's like this this thing on the end of a chain and it comes out and it was like really weird looking, but it was really cool because it it could do some damage and then you've had some like bow staff, some size and stuff like that. Uh but the the katanas, whenever anybody brought out the katanas, they were always the coolest. They always had the dopest forms. Um so I gotta oh, yeah. imagine that one was pretty fun too. Um oh, yeah. With the with that. this movie in particular, um, you know, do you feel like there was a scene? I'll, if you couldn't pick yours, is there a scene in this movie where you say this is what the turtles are, or this is what encapsulates the turtles? Oh wow! Um, well, f- <laughs> that's a that's an interesting question because, uh, and I think there is like con- I don't know if I would say controversy, but conversations of with fans over where this movie took the turtles uh, obviously they took them in a very teenage direction mm-hmm. uh, the scene of them there was always a scene of them screwing around on a roof and yeah. in this one it's it's them with the watermelon and throwing yeah. Uh, ninja you know, stars uh, yeah shurikens or ninja stars at his head and like what it was always like, what is that scene that shows like idiot kids like sh- like aiming like Roman candles at each other, you know, uh, stuff that I did as a kid. Uh, hey, will this work? It might. It could kill us. Let's just see, you know, like stuff like that. Um, I remember there was something with like pigeons. Like Michelangelo was like trying to see how many pigeons he could like get on his body. Yeah. And then- and then he's like starts to get lifted up and he's like whoa and they're like stop like something inherently new york but to me that encapsulates what this particular movie was going for like idiot kids kind of being away from their dad uh just uh being teens Mm -hmm. and uh enjoying themselves uh obviously there's a lot of scenes that were cut that kind of more, you know, uniquely define them. But I'd say the brothers come together at the end and that, but, but to me, that's the scene or, or, or like that scene of them, Michelangelo's like twerking and April's like filming them. <laughs> scenes like that, that, that was very much the goal with this movie is how teenage can we get these mm-hmm. kids, you know, and make them lovable and yeah. Which is different than it was maybe before. So I think people uh, had feelings about it, you know, and uh, I think it's it's fascinating. But anyways, oh, it, it... curious what your thoughts were. Like, you're such a turtle fan. What what did you like about the differences, or, or did they matter to you, or yeah? So... I've always been, not always, because this is something I've tried to be a little bit more conscious of these last couple of years. Um, you know, when it comes to when it comes to movies, TV shows, or anything like that, I always go in not with very low expectations, but I try to like disassociate myself with whatever I'm going and watching. That way, I can drop any kind of like 
preconceived notions of what I'm about to watch or what I'm, I just want to be a fan and enjoy of whatever I'm going, whether I like the movie or I know anything about the movie, whenever I go in and I watch something, I want to try to devoid myself of any kind of personal bullshit I might have against an actor or a writer, yada, yeah. yada, yada. So when I go in to this movie in particular, I'm already hook, line and sinker turtles. I've liked every rendition of the turtles. Even I know Michael Bay gets shit on a lot for the turtles uh, movies that he did. I didn't think they were bad. I just, it, this is where it kind of started for me, that whole, it's just not for me type of thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's for a younger generation. It's for a younger audience. Um, you know, so when I see this trailer, I, I alluded to this a little bit, uh, you know, before we hit record, when I saw this trailer, we were in the theater for, like I'd seen it on my phone and stuff like that, completely blows you out of the water when you go and you see it on the big screen. There's just some, yeah. like this is, this movie is not made for a little screen. This movie is made to be out in the wild with a shit ton of people, everybody collective group think laughing at these four guys doing these insane things because they're Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, right? You know, yeah. so we're in there, we're watching Spider-Man, um, you know, a few months before uh, Turtles comes out and the trailer comes on, right? And I already knew I was gonna be in love with this movie because of the act, the interaction I saw with my, my youngest son, Cooper. He's, like I said, he's two years old and you know, I taught him his colors by giving him M&Ms. So like he would get like five or six M&Ms, like those little M&Ms if he ate all of his dinner at the end of the night. And like we would tell the colors, right? Green, blue, red, brown, you know, uh, whatever other, yellow, um, orange. So he learned his colors that way. And then I, I, I've read to him every night since he was very, very little. And when he could start sitting up at like four or five months old, however they are, when they start sitting up and be able to hold their heads, I've been reading yep. to him the entire time. And I had cool. this turtle book. You know these little golden books they're like five bucks at the bookstore and stuff yeah so he would he would literally like i would point out every turtle i'd point out every villain and then he would mimic the names and shit, right so we're <laughs> sitting in the movie theater and then you know we're watching a kids movie but there's not a bunch of kids in the theater for spider-man and it's a bunch of adults right so i'm already thinking like oh shit, if he makes too much noise we're probably going to get kicked out you know what i mean so this it was it was very iffy like if i was going to be able to see all the spider-man with him or not yeah. so the ninja turtle trailer hits and like i said this is where you guys got my money before i saw that no diggity scene before anything that you guys had my money and you has you guys had my love and respect for this i'm looking out of the side of my eye because i start seeing him move around i figured he was just you know wanting to come closer or whatever and he's so little, I have to put my leg on his chair so he doesn't get <laughs> popped up, right? Yeah, so I've yeah. got my leg over there. And then I see him, and he's trying to stand up. And he's just yeah. yelling every turtle name, every villain name that he <laughs> knows. And, dude, I'm telling you right now, it almost brought me to it. tears because I'm looking at him. And then I'm I'm assuming this is what I look like at, a, as, at his age when my mom yeah. saw me going through the same turtle mania that I'm seeing him go through. And I'm sitting there and like my eyes are getting all misty and shit. And I'm like, dude, this is the <laughs> coolest fucking thing in the world. Like this little dude doesn't know. All he knows is these fucking turtles because I've read this book to him every night for the last fucking year. He knows yeah. all these turtles. He's so excited to see this movie, regardless of this movie, you know, good, bad or indifferent. You know, it, it was good or it wasn't good. It didn't live up to my expectations. That didn't fucking matter to me at this point because that little kid sitting next to me was having such a great time watching a three minute trailer. I was like, dude, if he likes three minutes of this shit, he's going to love an hour and a half of this stuff. Yep, I go in yep. there, I see this movie. I'm having fun because I'm with my kids and I'm just sitting here and I'm like, dude, this is like the first time I've felt like a kid probably in 20 plus years. I was like, cool. to, if you guys can elicit that kind of feeling out of me, and I'm not saying I'm a cold hearted, I'm not dead in the side or anything like that, but it's just like, you know, you kind of outgrow a lot of that stuff when you get older, you get responsibilities, you got all this stress that you got upon you, you know? So it's like, you try to, you know, prioritize and compartmentalize like what you get excited for. And I'm sitting here and I'm watching this shit. I'm like, dude, I have not been one this excited about a Turtles movie since fuck man probably that 2006 movie that came out right yeah. uh haven't been excited about turtles since 2012 when it come to the tv series when that 2012 nickelodeon series came out yeah. you know so it, it's been some time and and it was just like it, it transported me back to me being a kid and seeing that first ninja turtle movie seeing yeah. that 
Matt, like, like I've seen that movie so many fucking times. Like this podcast was started because of the Ninja Turtles. I told the story, ladies and gentlemen, I'll make it a quick one, so I apologize. But I was watching that first Ninja Turtles movie, and I just happened to look up, and it's during COVID, I just happened to look up, and then I'd seen the movie thousands of times at this point, right, as a kid. I burnt this DVD out on multiple occasions. This one, in <laughs> Dumb and Dumber, I burn out on VHS yep. two or three times, and my mom would not buy Dumb and Dumber again, right? So I always <laughs> had the Ninja Turtle VHS. So I just happened to look up when I'm cleaning, because I'm the only one home. You know, we hadn't had my two-year-old yet. Um, and then my, my oldest one, he's doing his homework on the computer and shit. Cause like I said, it's during the heart of COVID and I just happen to look up and I see some names and I was like, huh, why have I never heard that or seen that name before? I've like, I've, I feel like, you know, I feel like I should know this, this guy's name. So I, I pause it. His name was Gary proper. He was the guy that went into Detroit. He was the, the manager for, um, Gallagher at that time, uh, the comedian. And he was in Detroit touring oh. with Gallagher and stuff. And he goes into a comic book store in Detroit and he sees the first issue of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and he buys it off the shelf as a wall book. It's like $15 book right at that point. Now it's like a $25,000 book if you got it graded seven yeah. and above. Um, and he buys it and then he's like, holy shit, this is like the next thing. And he goes in front of every movie producer he can sit down with and said, hey, you guys got to get on this. And they laughed him out of the room. Right. They laughed right. him out of the room, said, who's going to fucking like Ninja Turtles? That doesn't make any sense. This is stupid. Get out of my office. Right. And he finally gets it going. And then this movie blows up. And then Turtle Mania, the 87 series had already hit. Right. The Playmates yeah. toy line was already blowing up. This movie catapulted it into the into the stratosphere. Right. And like I said, just just seeing these these movies and then trying to implement this, I was like, I got to talk to all these people. And I see this name and I just Google him and I, I find out he passed away like the year prior or two years prior. And I was like, fuck, that sucks. But this guy wrote an entire article, this this journalist for the newspaper. So he had his phone number down there. So I call it just off of a whim. I don't even know why I called it just to you know see what this guy was all about. And he told me, he's like, yeah, I, I interviewed him. I didn't ask too much about turtles. My kids are into turtles. He's like, I don't really care about the turtles. He was like, you should talk to this guy's manager. So that led to this. I was talking to this guy and it was a whole bunch of the guys that were in charge of the first movie, like a lot of the producers and the writers. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, they were like, hey, you seem pretty passionate about this shit. How about you do a podcast about the turtles? And I was like, well, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to talk to anybody and everybody that has anything to do with turtles, comic books, wow. movies, cartoons. That's what I want to do. Um, I had a name for it. It's called the Turtle Tapes. Um, and, uh, you know, and that kind of fell through with that guy. You know, he kind of ghosted me. And I was like, fuck, dude. I had already recorded my first episode with Rob Paulson, the original voice actor for Raphael in the 87 cartoon cool. series, yep. among other things. Um, and they were trying to get the early episodes I had. I had Francois Chow, the uh, second shredder from Secret of the Ooze, the super shredder. Um, you know, I had a couple other people from Turtle Stuff, and they just kept trying to get my content. I'm like, no, dude, I'm not going to. I did this on my own. I was like, you guys didn't pay me to do this. This is mine. So I'm just going to go ahead and do something else. Um, yeah. I figured I would run out of Turtle people to talk to really quick, which I did. I only had like three people in like the first six, seven months. Um, so I, I, I love animation. I mean, you can kind of see it. I'll take a picture and I'll send it to you. But yeah, I'm literally you that. your mural is awesome. Yeah, all yeah kinds I'm, of, I'm seeing I'm, Mario. I'm, oh, you can see it's really blurry on my side. Um, yeah, I no, I can see. I'm seeing SpongeBob. Some we got Pokemon, Pokemon yeah. in there. I'm thinking. I'm like, I don't want to mistake in it. Oh, there's Samurai Jack. Okay, cool. Oh, yeah, I'm totally Samurai Jack. Yeah, the best. Yeah, so you know, cool. it's it's just I put that shit all over the wall, man. And I, I loved animation. I love movies. I love comic books. Uh, you know, so I didn't want to typecast myself into just one narrow um, facet of fandom, right? So yeah. uh, I was like, let's just do all of animation because I love cartoons. I don't really have anybody to talk to with about cartoon. My friends watch it, but it's very we're like we're very different. Like my best friend, the only guy I really talk to, he does all anime. That's all he really watches. Yeah. Um, so I've gotten into that more. So you know, it went from turtles inspiring me to be in pop culture to turtles inspiring me to start this podcast, which is extremely cathartic at the end of the week, man. I get to talk to you guys uh, that created such great shit. And uh, I get to highlight you and then everybody else I have on this show because you guys put in so much hard work for this show. That's a long winded way of as answering your question of like, you know, what did I think of this? It started with that kid seeing that I was happy. And then seeing this movie, man, I, like I said, I absolutely loved it. There was not one scene that I thought in this movie to bring it all back around your question. There was not one scene in this entire movie that I was like, dude, come on. I got places to be like I was like I don't think I blinked with the exception of getting puked on by my, my two-year-old I don't think I really looked away from the screen 
yeah. at all, man. It was wow. it was so fun. It, it felt like it felt like that's what the teenagers sh- or not teenagers, excuse me. It felt like that if the Ninja Turtles were real, and they were teenagers, this is what they would do. They would do stupid yeah. shit like that. You know that scene where they're in the bedroom and they're like, "What would you do if you were like a, a normal person or, or a human?" That yeah. That that was another scene that I said would probably encapsulate the entire thing. Like that, if you think about the turtles, what are the turtles? That scene right there is 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 up there as well. It's just them projecting what they want to do and what they want to be. I, I just thought it was a beautiful moment, you know. Yeah, I agree that. Yeah, and thanks for uh, illuminating that for me. You know, I. Um, it's it's really I just love hearing people's connections with. The Ninja Turtles, and uh, just last night I was at dinner with some friends, and they're like, "Oh, you know, they're showing me videos of their attic, and it's their mom like set up like a shrine of all the family's Ninja Turtle toys, and <laughs> how much it meant to them, and how excited they are to see the new movie. They haven't seen it yet, so uh, yeah, I I just like I love hearing about the passion behind this and. It means a lot that people respond and like this movie. Like, uh, when you are working on a, I've never worked on a big IP before. Mm-hmm. This is my first time working on like a thing that has like a fan base. And that's, I now kind of get it. I, I sort of get what people you hear about in podcasts and mm-hmm. directors saying, yeah, feeling the pressure, you know, um, uh, because it, it means it means something to people and uh there is some degree of responsibility and i feel like jeff Rowe, you know directing this it was always coming from his love that he yeah. had as a kid he oh, would wear tell- like the the shirts that he, his turtle shirts that he had as a kid <laughs> like, oh, that's so or he'd cool. go rebuy them on ebay that were like the throwback you know the, some of the coolest like swag you know from the 80s and stuff but he was it was always coming from how he felt about the turtles as a kid and and honestly it came a lot from his love for the toys you know Mm -hmm. uh he really the mutants the whole presence of the mutant mayhem like yes it used to be called ninja turtles the next chapter Mm -hmm. and i'm so glad they freaking change the title of the movie because the next chapter that didn't mean anything it's like the next chapter what is that mutant mayhem it's like yes this is totally what we're going for he wanted slime ooze like the uh (laughs) barf you know like but also just the fun of the action figures you know uh i think it was muck bug which got changed into like scumbug or Mm -hmm. Uh, but yeah, it all just came from his love for his deep love of having those toys as a kid, and how can we kind of turn it into a movie that is oddly grounded and not very cartoony, actually pretty, uh, pretty gritty and like uh, it's very cinematic. Very cinematic. It's not like Cloudy of the Chance of Meatballs and Rubber Hosey at all. It's it's quite. Uh, he always wanted it to feel like you're watching like a skating video like uh with kids like dogtown and z boys like uh handheld camera what would a kid actually do in this thing not just what would a cartoon do um when people get hit they bleed mm-hmm. uh except donnie gets his like stabbed by a knife and nothing really happens <laughs> but they kind of joke about that later but um Anyways, yeah, uh, uh, just kind of rambling here, but uh, oh. I appreciate the love that people have, and and it definitely uh, it t- it t- it touched me. It it, it really yeah. uh, it it means a lot to me to see it come out, see the reactions, and to see like that love. And um, it's go it's going both ways from the creators and also the viewers, you know. So, anyways, there was a. No, I, I like those little rants because I, I literally took like fucking six minutes to explain to you my fandom and love for the turtles. And, I love that. Uh, I love I was, that. Yeah, you know. So there was there was one thing when I when when they broke out the uh, 
the shurikens or the uh, the ninja stars, there was one thing that I kept thinking back to, and I'm not saying it's out of the realm of possibility because of you know Seth Rogen being the guy, um, you know, helming it and you know really pushing the turtles movie through. And his humor falls along the same lines as South Park too, right? So I got to imagine he's probably a fan of South Park. Do you remember when all the boys got, um, they all got uh, ninja weapons? So they pretty much all got ninja turtle weapons. And then Butters (laughs) gets a a ninja star in his eye. You remember that? And they dressed him, Carmen dressed him up like a dog. (laughs) If I, like that would have been something I probably saw in like 2007 with all my buddies upstairs where we used to watch south park but yeah tell me again what happens he throw does it so they all go to the flea market or it's very blurry but you know the basis is all the boys get um get uh and it's an anime episode so they all turn into like oh. anime right so um they all get weapons and they all say it's like the whole christmas story you'll shoot your eye out type of thing you can't have these Cartman throws a ninja star and it catches Butters in the eye. So I think he convinces <laughs> Butters that the world has been taken over. So he takes yeah. Butters instead of getting him to a doctor. Cartman takes Butters to like a junkyard saying, hey, this world is getting ready to blow up. We have to put you in this bunker. And he dresses yeah. him up. I think he dresses him up like a dog or some shit. I like, can't remember. Um, but yeah, he ends up getting a fucking star in his eye and then it gets all infected and he's like, you know, he escapes essentially. But like when I see the ninja star in his leg and, I'm, and that's the first thing I thought of was like, oh, shit, I wonder if this was like it, were these guys watching South Park and this kind of, you know, influenced the scene. Total. I mean, this is a question. If you can get Gabe Lynn on, he, you know, was probably the first storyboard artist to work on this. Mm-hmm. And then he became the head of story and Kyler was the head of story and then he became the co-director. But Gabe was always doing that chop chop scene. That was his mm-hmm. scene. And uh <laughs> I'm sure I like Gabe Gabe has a pretty dark sense of humor and I don't really know what it was. I, I think all I know is the point of that scene was like how badly can this go for them? They're really trying to push like They've never really used their ninja skills before. Mm-hmm. Um, Raph is obviously dying to use oh, yeah. uh, violence. And <laughs> you got an anger problem. <laughs> yeah, he has anger problem. Yeah, you got anger problems, bro. And he's like, I don't care. I mean, I remember back in the day, they used to do, there was a little bit of a more expressionistic style in animation. I remember Raph gets kind of close to the camera and you could see fire in his eyes. Literally someone yeah. animated little <laughs> flames in his eyes. I think they took that out to make it a little more grounded. But that's Gabe. Gabe Lynn, man, he, genius. Like, he's just like, <laughs> I mean, if you look at his boards, there's a blood splatter and and Leonardo's face gets splattered in blood. And then he's like, ah, and he's looking around and he just has blood. <laughs> there's something wrong. There's always something scary about having someone else's blood on, like, your face. And they're scrambling and a lot more crow getting hit with like crowbars and stuff but uh no it's all it's totally seth rogan south park i think it's all like in that same like cloud uh yeah. you know so <laughs>